It's time for FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of After Hours. FNPS After Hours. On a windy afternoon in the February of this year, I had the distinct pleasure of chatting with Dr. Jack Putz of the University of Florida and artist Ellie Blair at the Withlacoochee Gulf Preserve, which is on the Gulf Coast of Florida near Yankee Town. This is one of the best places in the world to see the effects of sea level rise on natural ecosystems. Dr. Putz and Gene Kelly, our policy and legislation chair, led a mind-blowing field trip along this part of the Gulf Coast during our 2018 annual conference. Sea level rise is impacting ecosystems along the entire Gulf Coast of Florida. The story of how ecosystems are changing in the Withlacoochee Gulf Preserve and along State Road 44 is one that needs to be told. Enjoy as Dr. Putz and Ellie tell us this beautiful story tinged with sadness. What do I want to include? I definitely want that, those few spots where you can see the Gulf. Definitely want that. So, island, another island. <laughs> yeah, probably you don't want me talking on the video. <laughs> so when I look out at this landscape, I'm envisioning what's coming. And what's coming is this wave of mangroves that have moved from the south, coming in at kilometers per year moving northwards as the frequency of hard freezes decreases. And we haven't had a hard freeze here in 30 years and the mangroves are coming. As is always the case, when I'm painting outside, there's way, way too much information. You know, it's just sort of dazzling with information. So I find it useful to zero in on one thing, so say the horizon, and then build from there that clump of trees right there. So that's that. And, wh and what I'm using as this underpainting, although it's dark, it's all very weak pigment, so I can come back in with lighter colors and adjust, but I'm I, I sort of love, as I'm looking at the foreground, these patches of light, this, you, you can't see what I'm doing, maybe if you were standing over there, um, you know, these just little spots of white sky reflected in the water, it's just so beautiful. So kind of... It's almost like putting together a puzzle when there's a puzzle where you've got a thousand more pieces than you need to put the puzzle together. <laughs> extra pieces. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a puzzle with a lot of extra pieces. So there's this challenge to like, okay, what what's important? So given that the sun is, that I'm facing west and the sun is hurtling towards the horizon. I want to get as much as I can just kind of spotted, you know, just it's like almost, you know, boink, 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 getting, a, getting those few shapes that I really want to get into the finished picture. So when I started working here in the early 90s, these trees were alive. Most of the cedars, most of the dead red cedars succumbed after the storm of the century in the mid 90s, sat off the coast and there was a big storm surge here. Afterwards, it was dry and the salt got concentrated in the soil. Plus, some of the cedars were uprooted. The cabbage palms, many of them survived, but they've succumbed subsequently from tidal inundation and concentration of the salt. Well, we're, we're walking out to an island of forest in a sea of mostly black needle rush. Along the tidal creeks is salt marsh cordgrass, um, and there's patches of disticulus and other um, source of herbaceous vegetation. But as we get to this island, 
of forest notice that there are some live trees that don't look very good, but the understory is entirely salt marsh. Um, you often talk about warm colors. I don't quite understand what that means. Is that oh, well, um, the hottest colors, of course, would be yellow and red and orange. Mm -hmm. And the cool colors are blues and, it, you know, it, but it's, it's all so very relative. It, you know, you can have a warm blue or a cool blue. Like mm -hmm. a warm blue would be kind of a greenish blue. These are all very cool blues. You know, they tend almost towards violet. And a, a trick that the, the Impressionists used back in the olden days was they noticed that, you know, as things get closer to you, they seem to get warmer. And we look at the color of the grass. We know it's mm -hmm. the same grass in the foreground and off in the distance. But the, the colors in the foreground are brighter, warmer, more saturated, and the colors in the distance all sort of fade because we're looking through air. We're looking through the sky and the moisture in the air. So even though we know the local color of everything that we paint, the trees are the same color there and here, to give the effect of distance, it's useful to um, think about temperature. Temperature is kind of one of the tools for creating the illusion of space mm. and distance. Another uh, tool is perspective. So there's the things in the foreground are bigger. <laughs> the things in the background are smaller. So I, I'm, I guess I'm trying to get in as much of the dark stuff as I can. Then I'm going to start adding the lighter colors. This process of forest replacement by salt marsh starts in the understory um, and regeneration of canopy trees stops long before the canopy trees die. But even before that, a whole sequence of species disappears, starting with the elms um, and the ashes and the maples. They go first. The oaks and the pines hang along, hang on for a little bit longer. And finally, you're left with red cedar and cabbage palm. And then the cabbage palm are the last ones to go and as a consequence of, of increasing soil salinity. I just want to get the sky in there because I need everything else to be relatively in tune with what the sky is. Again, we look at it, in this case, the sky seems to be much lower to the, uh, much lighter towards the horizon and darker, bluer as it goes up. So, and you can see how the light colors are so much stronger. It's pretty easy to go right over the dark stuff and get the shapes that I want, working with negative space. Mm, look at that, some more uh, ocean. <laughs> I just, I love the way the path of the visible patches of water across the flat land leads you all the way out to the horizon line of the Gulf. I just think it's an amazing phenomenon. Is that what's drawing people into the painting? Or you're hoping it does? Or? Well, you know, people paint particular subjects for different reasons. For me, personally, I'm satisfied with a painting when somebody looks at it and they feel like they can enter into it. And so any device that helps do that, 
a path in the woods or um, it's just a great way to uh, to capture somebody's eye and sort of take them on a little walk into the part of the painting that's actually not visible <laughs> that's just uh, what they know is there Got a little bit more strong light just okay I wish that as a scientist I could do that better more effectively to draw people into a scene like this and, and see what it has been and what it's becoming seasonally and annually and then over the decades I know it's something we were talking about before that I'm looking in the moment this right now and I think when you look at this place you're looking at thousands of years <laughs> you know you can see the process from your perspective in a very different way well it is like I'm trying to run the movie forwards and backwards <laughs> you know when if we've been here the height of the last glaciation this is all before us just 14,000 years ago um, but I've been coming here since the early 90s and you've been coming here for longer and yeah it's 70s. changed even in that short period of time so, and that's what we've been monitoring so there are patches of dead trees out in the marsh now that were alive in the 90s and other places where there's still some live trees but if you look under them there's no tree regeneration it's salt marsh and those trees aren't going to be alive for that much longer either so i am trying to convey this temporal version of this landscape backwards and forwards to understand it better but sometimes the words fail me in that regard this patch of forest is on the south side of state road 40 where it's bathed by flooding waters from the Withlacoochee River. And we see here 20 species of canopy trees. Immediately on the other side of the road where that washing effect is blocked, we have only cabbage palms and red cedars. This dynamism of, of species replacing one another happens here as black needle rush spreads vegetatively into a patch that's now dominated by disticulus. They're both moving in in the understory of, of, of cabbage palm and red cedar forest. Cabbage palm and red cedar forest have replaced way more diverse forests. So um, you could see how this is happening. I'm, I'm you know, having established the darks, partly because the light is just going to be changing, you know, in minutes. There's, it's such a, a fleeting, opportunity to capture a certain thing that um, I, I, I find it's like I'm working against will it start raining will it will the wind blow everything off the top of the tower <laughs> you know all the things that might happen that will require me to stop so there's having learned to paint by painting outdoors, I've, I've learned really quickly to just get the most important thing right away. You know, not thinking, well, this is, you know, art with a capital A that's going to end up, you know, hanging on the wall at the Met, but it's a sketch and it's important for me to see what I'm looking at. That may seem obvious, but I know a lot of landscape painters that come out and they, they look at the reality, but they paint a memory or something other than what's right in front of them and for me it's really important to try to as much as humanly possible given the time constraints and what I can make the paint do and the weather and the light and the that it's just really important to see what's the most important part of this image it's just marvelous to see this emerge. I wondered for a while there, but, <laughs> but it's also interesting that 
you're painting a gradient and you talk about a gradient and the warmth of colors and so forth and I'm I'm seeing a slope of course one of the amazing things about this part of the world is the slopes are so low you know here it drops you know a foot to the mile um, and as we look out to the gulf there from the the ground on those patches of forest to the gulf is is only but two three feet in so I'm seeing that gradient even it's hard to perceive that it's downhill um, of course the water and the creek flows back and forth pretty couple times a day um, all these tidal creeks are doing that so you can see what I'm, I'm noticing in the foreground like way stronger color yeah as the tidal creek is meandering across the landscape it's cutting on some banks and depositing on other banks and it's changing the species and so on. I'm watching that happen although it probably take a couple hundred years for the stream to meander its way across the landscape. Those patches of forest are a foot or two higher than the surrounding salt marsh. What I'm also seeing is that the effects of sea level rise and this is probably the best place in the world to see that because it is so low and flat and the gulf out there has only small tides it's a low wave energy coast so the signal of sea level rise to the noise of tides and waves is is really dampened here so um, we can see what's happening with sea level rising at only an eighth of an inch a year but when you're talking about a few feet an eighth of an inch a year mounts up pretty fast. So I'm looking at an island or a patch of forest surrounded by a sea of salt marsh there that when I first came here in, in the early 90s all the trees were alive. And behind it is another patch of forest where the trees are alive but there's nothing no trees in the understory it's it's all salt marsh. And so this process of transition from forest to salt marsh that's been going on most recently for the last 14,000 years it's going on fairly fast certainly at decadal intervals you can see the effects and if you come back to this scene in 10 years that patch out there with live cabbage palms and and a few cedars will be dead trees the dead trees here in the foreground will have fallen down and it'll just be salt marsh. But if you go out there and walk, then you'll be stumbling across stumps and, um, and fallen logs and so forth of the, of the dead red cedars. I like this contrast of an artist and a scientist looking at the same <laughs> landscape and seeing very different things. I think we're seeing the same thing. Our, our, our brains just process it in a di different way. I, I try to... I try to attain beginner mind and, and just operate as though I have never seen this before. Hmm. and that I don't try to paint a formula, something that's worked before, but I, I enter into this incredible challenge. I mean, this is a challenge, you know, it's a challenge. It's like, how do you translate this incredible place into a, a small handmade image that when I get it home and, and hang it on the wall, somebody will look at it and they'll, they'll go, aha, this is a place that I could go that exists in reality. Um, it's kind of magical. The human brain can look at dabs of paint and say, oh yeah, that's grass, that's trees, that's palms, that's water. Well, even, <laughs> even odder is that I'm looking out towards the Gulf and, and I'm seeing the, the mangroves that are marching in as the frequency of super hard freezes decreases. Oh yeah, there's a mangrove right there. <laughs> <laughs> I see them, you didn't paint them, but they're there. 
eye of the beholder, I suppose. She's captured the whole gradient of cabbage palm life and death out there. In places where they're young cabbage palms and places where the cabbage palms are still alive but haven't reproduced in 30 or 40 years and then some lone cabbage palms with really kind of yellowish leaves and not doing very well and then some stands of dead palms and, and what's remarkable is that all this has happened in just 30 years or 40 years and I mean, as we speak, the the trees out there are suffering from salt damage, from um, tidal surges, super high tides, and um, but cabbage palm is our most resistant species to salt effects. Red cedar is right up there um, in in resistance, but those of the upland forest species are are the most salt tolerant. Of course, those mangroves that Ellie's capturing somehow coming in from the <laughs> from the coast are, are totally tolerant of of salt and here at this latitude where mangroves are new um, well new recently anyway we have all three species and, and I can't quite distinguish them in her painting but um, well there's there's there. the red there's <laughs> don't tell me <laughs> she's faking um, The gulf out there on the horizon isn't very salty, um, only like 16 parts per thousand, which is half of pure strength seawater um, in salt. But when you get one of these tidal surges, then, and if it's not followed by heavy rain, then that salt accumulates as water evaporates and it gets more and more concentrated and that's what stresses the trees. In the case of cabbage palms, the young ones go first because they don't have enough stored water in their stems. The bigger palms are during periods of high soil salinity or, or lack of water, they're depending on stored water in the trunks. But they also, are, I believe, are taking water in from rain um, right into the crowns. That hasn't been tested yet, but have circumstantial evidence that that's happening. We're in with Lacucci Gulf Preserve, um, which is where in the early 90s we started a long-term study on sea level rise. And it was the owner's concern about dead and dying cabbage palms that, that got it started. Since then, we've been monitoring tree growth and death and reproduction. And, and so we can say with a fair degree of accuracy, if we know the elevation of a patch of forest, how long it's been since the cabbage palms reproduced, for example, how long the cabbage palms will live, um, and how long the, it will be before the forest becomes salt marsh. We know less about what happens at the end out there by the gulf as the salt marsh gives way to mud flats and mud flats to oyster bars and grass flats, but Right here, it's so obvious what's going on. Um, and beautiful at the same time. I think this looks pretty good. I think it looks great, Ellie, especially where you started a half hour ago. It was like, so is it half an hour? Yeah. <laughs> I was never really concerned. So. Okay. All right. Uh, anything you'd like to say to the audience? You guys? Well, good work on the video. Oh, thanks. I'm glad you guys liked it. <laughs> I, you know, I know I'm left-handed, but I never see another left-handed painter. So when I see myself in a video, I'm like, that's interesting. Looks like I'm using my wrong hand, but of course, nope, left-handed. 
<laughs> and I also, I'm just so grateful that the whole image got preserved as video because for me, that's the fun of the painting is watching it happen. You know, seeing it go from blank canvas to finished image is, is just an exciting part of the process that most people don't ever get to see. You just see the finished painting, which is like looking at a photograph of a dance from my point of view. I haven't gotten to watch much art. You know, I don't, I don't have a lot of artist friends. So, I mean, this was just such a treat to be able to watch it, you know, go from something to, I mean, go from nothing, a blank canvas to, oh, I mean, there's some squiggles there. I don't really know what she's doing. Is this going to be a painting? I'm not really sure to I mean, just gorgeous rendition of what's happening there in the Withacoochee Gulf Preserve. Most painters aren't comfortable painting with an audience. But I learned how to paint because somebody asked me to teach a landscape painting class. And so I'd been to art school and I knew, you know, drawing and color theory and all that. So I was, I just showed up for class and basically taught myself how to paint while my class was watching me <laughs> and in the process of teaching everybody else how to paint. So I, my whole development was with an audience and that uh, I think is one possible explanation for why it doesn't bother me at all to, to work with an audience. But so many of my artist friends couldn't do that. It's not comfortable. Much more interesting watching a painting happen than watching science getting done. <laughs> it's usually a lot of very boring scenes. Um, but at least it, doing science in a place as lovely as with the Kuchi Gulf Preserve is pretty good, yeah. Plus, you, when you point out things from scientific observation, then from that point on, every time I see that thing, I have this additional knowledge about what I'm looking at. For instance, the rolling hills as we drove out through Williston, I guess, out to the Gulf, you pointed out, oh, these were sand dunes, what, how many thousands of years ago? The and last interglacial, yeah. So how long ago were those rolling hills sand sand dunes? And I'd never, it just never crossed my mind what that lovely, you know, gently rising and falling road, you know, that we all love to drive along on our way to the Gulf, that that was sand dunes from a really long time ago. Now oh. I can't drive there at all without thinking this used to be the beach. It's going to be the beach again, too. Um, <laughs> Sooner rather than later. And we're doing everything we can to speed that up. <laughs> well, you know, beachfront property. You know, I mean, that's one way to, you know, inflate real estate values slightly inland. <laughs> okay, Did we you? got, oh, sorry, I was going to say we got some questions in the chat. Oh, yay. Yeah, you want to handle them? Okay, Julie Morris. Uh, who is a conservationist, um, asks, do you think that Winslow Homer captured sea level rise in some of his paintings along the St. John's and at Homosassa? I don't think he was thinking about sea level rise when he was painting. I don't think that was even on the radar, even of the most uh, diligent scientists when Winslow Homer was painting. Jack? But no, I, I agree, but it would be interesting to go back if we could find where he was painting um, and see how much things have changed because, you know, 100 years have passed or more. And uh, that would be fascinating. We're doing that with um, like the journals of, of Thoreau, you know, he made when he was living out in the woods. Um, we go back and he made detailed notes of when thing, when species were in flower, and now we know that's changed by a month. Um, they're flowering a month earlier, and, and so it'd be nice to do that with paintings. And maybe with the the new Vickers collection of paintings at, at University of Florida, the Harlem Museum, we could find some of those scenes and go back and look at them. That'd be somebody's, a great thesis project to uh, 
track down the actual locations. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, William Bartram and his lovely book, The Travels of William Bartram, traveled through Alachua County and described in detail places that the, the uh, park rangers at Paynes Prairie Park uh, back in the 80s actually put some energy into trying to figure out what William Bartram was talking about, what places. And I did an art show back then, um, this little gallery in Gainesville, uh, the art collector, I think. Anyway, um, I, this was back when the Paints Prairie was closed to the public, so you could only have access if you had a ranger with you. And uh, one of the rangers had tracked down as many of the actual locations that Bartram had described in his book and took me to them so that I could paint the, uh, the places that Bartram described. And alas, we did not have a scientist with us <laughs> who might have, but it was, it was really an interesting way to see the prairie. And, uh, you know, and then we, the gallery did a lovely job where they actually took the quotes from Bartram's book and we used the quotes kind of as the labels for the paintings. But yeah, it would be fascinating to think about all the all those Florida landscapes now that are at the Harn from the Vickers collection and how, how interesting it would be to see what those places look like now, how many of them have condos built on top of them. Or are miles to sea or miles inland anymore. Yeah, I mean, just more if I mean, if you could accurately spatially locate them, they're just additional data for uh, historical ecology work. <laughs> wonderful. One of the wonderful features of that Big Bend coast there is that it's so wild. Um, you know, it's just the, it's the longest stretch of undeveloped coastline in the lower 48 states. You can't get more wild than that. And and looking at sea level rise there does, it's not, does not get confused by pumping of water from the aquifer because, you know, there are a few hunt camps but, and little Yankee town, but they're not, they're not drawing down the aquifer. So you're not getting that saltwater intrusion effect that you would get down by Tampa or over by Jacksonville. I mean, sea level's happening everywhere. Some places you're getting a subsidence, but not in the Withlacoochee area because you know, as you walk out through the salt marsh, you don't sink in very far because a lot of the time you're walking on rock. It's the limestone pavement. So it's very stable. And so you can see this effect of sea level rise without subsidence or, or, or the rising of the land as is happening in the mid-Atlantic states or big waves crashing as you'd get with nor'easters um, in the Jacksonville area. So it's a d wonderful place to see, as you mentioned, a wonderful place to see the effects of sea level rise. Jack, how many miles actually are undeveloped on that, in that area? Well, I mean, you have the whole series of, of state and national reserves. I don't know how many miles it is, but you have Homosassa and Chazowitzka National Wildlife Refuge, with Lacucci, Wakasasa Bay Preserve, Cedar Key Reserve, the Suwannee River Protection Areas, and then you keep going. And so it's, um, I'm not sure. I mean, it's north of Tampa to south of Tallahassee and all of that is, is um, St. Mark's it's huge as well along the coast. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Really funny to hear you say the word nor'easter and Jacksonville in the same sentence. <laughs> oh, they happen. Mm. Uh, Marjorie has an art question for you, Ellie. Um, oh. uh, did you use a toned background before you started painting? Yes. Yes, I um, almost never paint directly on white. I always tone my canvas, usually with some middle value, sometimes a cool gray, sometimes kind of a tan color, but uh, and the reason is the, the thing that 
I use most commonly to create an effect, a realistic effect is contrast of value. So if I'm working on a white background, every color is darker than white. Even yellow is darker than white. And so I essentially have to cover the entire canvas with paint before I can begin to correctly judge relative value again, because otherwise it's this glaring white that makes seeing those nuances of value contrast invisible because the white just, so I, uh, I tone the ground. Sometimes um, if I haven't had the foresight to prepare a canvas with a toned ground, I'll just wash the whole surface of the white canvas with a thin coat of some neutral dark color so I get a middle value that I can then from that add light and dark and I can see it from the beginning. I can see relative value. I don't have to paint the painting and then go back and correct it. So um, yeah, that's it was they were all on toned grounds. If you like look back at a painting that you've done, like the one behind you, would you know what tone you used for the toned ground? <laughs> well, I can tell because I painted the edge. <laughs> so let me, let me just look. And <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a, a gray. In fact, the background Sort of almost exactly mm -hmm. that color, like right there. And the, um, I mean, that, that, that background color serves a number of functions and it surprises me that so few artists use a toned ground, but uh, so, so Basically, as I'm painting, it, I have that immediate ability to observe relative value changes. Also, if you've got painting white, and especially for the plein air pieces, you, dash, you see how quickly I paint, dash, 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 dash. Well, in that process, there are going to be places where my brush missed the canvas. And so the painting is done but there are all these little white specks where the brush mi missed, because the canvas has texture, so the brush may miss areas. So the, finish, the painting is finished, but then there are all these little white specks that you missed. Then you have to go back and paint, you know, fill in all those little white dots. Well, that's like just turning the lights out. It's, it's, just, it's just killing the painting, all the like, the gestural energy of the brush stroke, you lose that if then you go back and you're like, rah, 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 you know, and just filling in all those little specks of white. So that's, so that the neutral ground is another useful thing to have established. So when I paint on top of it, I can stay very fresh. And then I'm not gonna have a bunch of little white specks showing through. So and you don't third, go back in and do that, tap, 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 tap. You don't have to no, do that no. at all. Yeah, so like this one. Oh, and then the other thing is, it kind of subliminally ties the painting together. So although it looks like this painting behind me is completely covered with paint, I have missed spots. But, you know, you'd never know it because it's, it's just this sort of neutral, cool gray. And it's, oops, still wet, so. <laughs> so, it kind of subliminally ties the whole painting together compositionally, that you have that same neutral color just peeking out in these little specks all across the surface of the canvas, makes the whole painting feel like there's a harmonious color thing going on. So all very useful. And then occasionally, I mean, I don't do commissions anymore, but when I used to do commissions, occasionally I'd get, you know, somebody would want me to do a series of paintings and the color scheme was mauve and teal, but they wanted landscapes and, and they wanted their paintings to match the color scheme of the office. And oh. so what I could do is just take, paint my background, the color that they wanted, that turquoise or that crazy purplish mauve or whatever, paint that as my underpainting. 
tone. And then I could paint whatever I wanted. And when the paintings got installed in that teal and mauve <laughs> office, they looked good there because they had this little secret you know, layer of tiny specks of color that matched the woodwork. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so uh, there's lots of good reasons to do it. Uh, mostly, I just think it makes the painting better. Another art question from Marjorie. Uh, she says, you mentioned that you had never painted mangroves. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, I just never had an opportunity to paint mangroves. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm here. You're in Gainesville. And, uh, yeah, and when I go to the ocean or the Gulf, I go to Crescent Beach or Cedar Key. And uh, so I hadn't really considered mangroves as a subject uh, until Jack pointed them out, and, you know, loaned me his boots. And, <laughs> led me on a hike <laughs> through the, you know, the marsh to look closely at red mangroves and black mangroves and white mangroves. And so, yeah, it was a, a challenge for sure, because uh, they're just such a, I mean, palm trees are the same coming from the North. They're just so ridiculous. Palm trees are just the most ridiculous lollipop shape. And, same with mangroves. I mean, they look like they're, they can walk. <laughs> you know, they, they look like some, something from outer space uh, to my New York City eyes. But, uh, so I, yeah, I, actually in my collection, I think I ended up one, two, at least three of my paintings have clearly uh, rendered mangroves, none of which actually satisfied the professor. So uh, he, he sent me some uh, reference, some sort of more scientific illustration kinds of mangroves so that I could actually see the way the roots do come out from one another in a kind of a horizontal way. Um, yeah, so it was fun. Speaking of the, you know, the number of paintings you did, is the thing, is your artist showing, is that a public thing? Would you like to talk about it? Yes, it is a public thing. The um, Gainesville Fine Art Association has been doing this um, studio tour for a number of years. It was canceled last year because of the pandemic. But they have, um, it's kind of cool. I wasn't, I didn't participate in years past, but I loved being able to go around town and see artists' workspaces. And that's what it is. Most artists work at home and they have, they live in a typical suburban home, but you walk, walk in the front door and it's a print shop or a jewelry making or pottery or glass blowing or, you know, it's sort of fascinating to see how artists do such interesting things with the standard, you know, three bedroom, two bath, you know, mid-century ranch. And it was just, I just loved it. I loved being able to go around and, and, and see how artists transform your typical American home into a creative space. And I had intended to participate last year as I moved my studio from downtown Gainesville to my home a couple of years ago. And uh, of course it was canceled because of the virus. But uh, this year, I think we've got, I the brochure here, 14, 14 artists participating. And you can go, I think the, um, you can get the map with everybody's addresses. Gainesville Fine Art Association. So GFAA studio tour.org, O-R-G. You go there and it'll give you um, 
the 14 artists in their addresses and then it's kind of an easter egg hunt you know you get out google your phone and type in the address and you know find all the artists living in their otherwise impossible to find <laughs> homes and uh yeah it was really kind of fun to, to see how people transformed their homes into their workspace and i bought some art i bought a piece of pottery i bought a couple of paintings i bought a print it was sort of a fun thing to do anyway this year uh it's this coming weekend so friday night from five to nine my band the weeds of eden will be playing i'm sharing my home with my friend Dorota hammond who's uh does um ceramic porcelain ceramics and she's going to be showing her work and it should be fun and i'm it's like the big unveiling for the with lacucci paintings because i kind of held them back i didn't want to i did sell a few but i as i said before i wanted to hang on to them uh, so i'd have them on hand when we when we figured out which ones would be in the magazine so that a, an actual photographer could make good photographs from the paintings and i wouldn't have to track them down but now it's the paintings are the pub the magazine is out and the you know so it's it's sort of the grand unveiling i almost never in fact i have never done a collection of 16 paintings at one location and kept them all until they were all finished and then since then i've actually done two two more including this one behind me of the with lacucci so it's kind of this this event is sort of a grand unveiling of my with lacucci golf preserve collection so i'm really looking forward to letting people into my house and uh, I'm using it as an excuse to finally do a little house cleaning. And um, it'll be Friday evening till nine and then Saturday and Sunday from 10 in the morning till five in the afternoon. So yeah, just go to the Gainesville Fine Art Association website. You can find the link, it's free, open to the public. Uh, really looking forward to it. And hopefully Jack, are you gonna be able to come Friday night for a little while? I'm still trying. It sounds like quite an event. So, <laughs> well, I'm sad Marjorie had to cancel because she was going to come up and stay here at my house. But life got complicated. So, but it's going to be fun. And uh, yeah. So, anyway, after a year and a half of uh, you know COVID lockdown it's it's time for me to get out the vacuum cleaner and welcome people into my home again got my shots yep i would like to try and come yeah it'd be great okay we've got some compliments from bill klein he says watching a painting develop and be finished was great also getting the science background was great. And he has a question. Do you have any info on how Yankee Town and Cedar Key are planning for sea level rise? That's a question for Jack. Yeah, um, yeah both communities have been quite proactive. In, in fact, I think Yankee Town had a model um, adaptation plan that's, you know, I've been built on since then. They developed that almost eight or nine years ago with a group from the law school here. So I, I'm not sure the details of those plans, but their well fields are an issue and um, of course flooding um, events. But yeah, I, I don't know the details of their plans, but I know they have been quite out, you know, quite aware of what's going on. And, and when we were starting the research there, we went out and interviewed um, local people and it was super interesting because uh, fishermen, this was before GPS and fishermen out in the Gulf, you don't have a mountain range to orient by. And, and you'll notice on a map that a lot of the inlets are, are named after trees. There's three palm inlet and two palm inlet and the crooked tree inlet. Well, you know, those trees are all gone now. So fortunately we have GPS because when you're out there in the Gulf, 
there's nothing to see, um, you know, at some distance because uh, you can't orient by those trees. So they were very well aware that, that there was a lot of change happening. And you don't get the blue sky flooding like you do in, in Miami um, and, and some other coastal cities, but they're seeing it in, in, in the biota as well, fish and birds and so forth. Everything is shifting. So, um. Awesome. Thanks, Jack. Another one for you. Uh, Julie Morris asks, please explain again how mature cabbage palms use stored water to tolerate the salt and young palms do not. Well, it, you might have noticed that when palms are being transplanted to, you know, they get dug up in the wild and, and then transplanted into suburban and urban settings, they, they're transplanting very large palms. And when you talk to the people who do that work, they say, yeah, the small ones, you can't move. Um, now, if they're potted and grown in a nursery, then you can move small ones. But the, the bigger ones depend on water that's stored in the trunk. And actually, Missy Holbrook did this research as a when she was a master's student here at University of Florida. She's now a professor at Harvard. But um, back then, she inserted probes in the trunks of palms and then um, stressed them, denied water to, to those palms and watched as they, and then added water again and watched as the water contents went up and down. And it's not huge amount of water, but it's enough to keep the palm alive while um, it, it doesn't have access to, to fresh water. So in these situations where the soil water is, is saline for a while, the palm can shut down its water uptake and, and go with those stored reserves, at least to get it through the, the really dry part of the day. But in, in her studies, we, we moved the palms into a greenhouse. They were sticking out of the top of the greenhouse, but the pots were wrapped in plastic. So there was no water coming into the pots. And they were on long eye beams that we could measure the weight of the palm very accurately. Um, they're on an analytic balance. So we were measuring to the hundreds of a gram of, of water content. But what we didn't account for was water that was coming into the crown of the palm um, from rain. And, and that's something that I still want to study, um, but haven't been able to yet, because I think that there's some water that's getting replenished. The trunk water is getting replenished by rain that's coming in funneled down through the through the stock, the, um, the petioles of the leaves through the rachis and into that crown and, uh, and absorbing it there. But yeah, the big palms gaining and losing water, storing a substantial quantity is, is pretty important, I think, for their, um, their life in places where they're sub susceptible to drought or drought caused by, by salt. And so the difference between the young palms and the, the older the mature palms is they just don't have the size? The volume, they just don't have, they can't store enough water. Um, I, I think that's that's the answer. So they're storing some, but just, you know, proportionate. Yep. It's not enough to handle the transpiration yep. loss. Okay. Yep. Uh, Bill Klein says, I heard that large cabbage palms are easier to transplant than small ones along the same line, uh, while other trees transplant easier when they are small. Is this yeah. true? I mean, yeah, we just discussed it. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, you, you never would want to transplant a big tree if you had a small one, but it's quite the, quite different. And that's a problem now with um, the cabbage palm decline, the the this new disease of, of palms, that palms are being moved from areas that where the infection has already taken root, um, and those palms are don't are asymptomatic when they're suffering from, from the cabbage palm decline and they get moved and planted and then they quickly die, but they also have brought the, the bug that carries the bacterium with them. And then so you can get a local outbreak. And, and it's really frustrating for me that even though we now have diagnostic methods for, um, for this disease, that we're not testing plants in, um, 
in nurseries. We're not testing plants that are being transported. So the vector for this pathogen is a, is, are, are, are these small uh, true bugs, the larvae of which feed on the roots of palms and grasses. So that's another part of the story that I think is interesting. But the, the most important vector is trucks carrying infected palms at 55 miles an hour all around the Southeast. And, and we're, we haven't done anything to, to slow that down. And, and you're seeing more and more dead palms in, in, in commercial plantings along roads and so forth. I never remember seeing dead cabbage palms anywhere other than where sea level rise was happening. And now you're seeing it all the time. And some of those palms get infected by turf grass that's being planted, you know, that pl grown. It's the biggest crop in Florida in terms of areas, turf grass. It gets transplanted and put into lawns, gardens, you know, shopping centers and so forth. And it has the, it has the bug with the pathogen there and then they infect the palm that otherwise would have been uh, disease free. And that you can't, if, you can't, that a palm is infected and asymptomatic is, is problematic because by the time it started showing the lethal bronzing effect, the fruits fall first and then the old leaves turn yellow or bronze and then the younger leaves die eventually. That's way too late. And, and there's, you can keep a palm alive that's infected, um, but you have to continually, every six months or something, you have to inject it with um, an antibiotics and um, they retain the disease, but it doesn't progress. So th this is a bad one and it's our state tree. And uh, this issue of, of the palmetto is dedicated to cabbage palms and for good reason. And we're really hoping that awareness increases and pressure increases to the nurserymen's associations and, and, the, and the small companies that are moving palms um, so that something is done, some kind of phytosanitary certification or um, some control, but, but so far there's been nothing. And we don't have a very good history of stopping tree diseases. I mean, laurel wilt was introduced in what, 2002? And now you can't find a live, large live bay tree anywhere in the state. Um, and hemlock woolly adelgids moved through starting in the nineties. We don't have hemlocks in Florida, but they don't have hemlocks in Massachusetts anymore either. Um, and, and so it's one after another and we're not learning lessons. Um, and, but people don't like regulation and they don't like to be interfered with. But what's at stake is you know, perhaps the most important tree in the state of Florida for wildlife, for painters, um, for, you know, for all of us who enjoy nature. It, uh, it just, the world without cabbage farms is just, too terrible to contemplate. I agree. Yeah, I was looking at <clears throat> writing a blog post. Uh, there's some recent research about how the invasive species regulations, how, comparing invasive species regulations across the different states, because, you know, if they're not consistent, you can bring invasive species, you know, into Georgia. It's not prohibited, but maybe it's prohibited in Florida. And just the research is basically all of these lists are completely reactive. I mean, they're not proactive in any way. And in fact, in some in some of these states, including Florida, you can't list something as invasive unless it's already proven to be invasive. And so, you know, we have a governance, a legislative governance problem, you know, that's, I mean, unfortunately not gonna be solved by some FNPS after hours, but <laughs> at least we can right. accurately no, it's identify. it's already too late. Uh, we got a sort of question comment proposal from Marjorie. Any thoughts on the art science collaboration experience you both had at the Withlacoochee Golf Preserve? Also, how can more of these kinds of collaborations take place? What do you say, Jack? No, I, the, the whole nexus, this connection is, is so wonderful. And, and I think there's, there's growing 
um, inertia for this. And, and in some circles, the, the push for, in, you know, I'm a university professor and, the, and I'm in the STEM disciplines, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. But there's a real effort to make it into STEAM and to include the arts because, you know, scientists are not very effective at communication. Um, you know, we do the science, but we need those skill sets that, you know, people like Ellie bring in um, and, and writers and filmmakers and so forth. And, it, and it's just crazy and short-sighted and, and just stupid to focus only on the science without recognizing the, the importance of, of, of the arts in, in messaging um, and in understanding. I mean, I see things differently because of my conversations over the decades with, with Ellie and other artists, but particularly Ellie, and it's just such an education for me, it's thrilling. Um, and are hoping for more of that. Yeah, when uh, Jack and I have known one another for many years, and we have spoken and actually tried in the past to do some sort of collaborative thing and it wasn't until I got the call from Marjorie to say, hey, could we use one of your paintings on the cover of this magazine we do? And she, um, she described the magazine, which I knew nothing about. She said, well, we usually choose, you know, three scientists who each write articles. And then she rattled off, you know, and Jack puts is one of the, and I'm like, Jack, I know Jack. And so that, uh, the idea for a collaboration wasn't new to us, but it was the first time we kind of had a deadline, which I don't know about scientists, but artists kind of need a deadline. Otherwise, you know, so yeah. So it was kind of exciting to suddenly have this structure that we could both fit our different skills into. So, um, once we had to go, we had the, the time that the article had to be written and the paintings had to be done. We took, Jack and I took two trips out to the Gulf together. The first time we had a newspaper reporter and um, one of your grad students took a lot of photographs. You lend me your boots so we could get to the mucky places. And then Jack and I went out again with you and who else went with us that time? Oh, yeah. we had some people from Tarflower who were going to help film, uh, but they were right. late. And then also, I don't, I don't have any assistance normally, so I didn't really know what to do with them. <laughs> yeah. So there. So um, and then I went back a third time because Jack was really attached to me doing a painting of a mangrove that worked for him. So I went back a third time to really just take some close up photographs of mangroves. And, um, and then, I mean, it was just, like I say, just having that structure, having like someone that wasn't me or him saying, okay guys, <laughs> you know, and, and I have to say it was a bit of a challenge for me. Um, there is, I did do some writing for the article uh, which I really hadn't anticipated. I thought I could just get away with pictures. But Jack, um, you know, always the teacher, is used to getting people to do more than they thought they could do. <laughs> so I'd write, send it, and he'd say, yeah, no more. And I'd write some more and send it, and he'd go, that's good, but add, you could do a little one. I'm like, oh. <laughs> But, uh, you know, overall, a wonderful experience. And yeah, I, I went to a school, the art school I attended in New York, in New York City, was the Cooper Union. And it was founded in 1859. And it was, the, the whole name of the school is the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. And for the first 100 or so years, the art school was for women and the engineering school was for men. And then sometime after the Second World War, they changed that. And they started letting women into the engineering school and they started letting men into the art school. And 
when I was a student there back in the 60s, the administration was always trying to figure out ways to get, and we were in different buildings on opposite sides of the street. And the engineers were all 16 years old and um, living at home. And the artists were all, many of the artists were like uh, veterans and um, in general, much older and uh, living in their own apartments. And so there was uh, all kinds of gaps to bridge. And um, one of the ways one of my teachers did it was they, this was computers were very new and this was back when to program a computer, you had like a shoe box full of these cards, mm -hmm. you know, the original do not fold, spindle or mutilate card. Jack, have you got one? <laughs> anyway, and so they assigned the artists to go across the street into the hallowed halls of the engineering school, find an engineer and get some random engineer to explain to us how computers work. And then our project was to do some sort of graphic thing to show how computers work. So first of all, we had to find an engineer who was willing to try to explain to us how a computer worked. And then we had to figure out a way to visually represent that. I think actually the name of the class was visual communication. And so it was a really fascinating project because there it is. <laughs> I know I remember the, the screams of agony when somebody would trip down the, uh, you know, trip down the stairs carrying a shoebox full of um, oops, full, up full of those cards, and they'd all go flying down to two flights of stairs and now they'd be hopelessly out of order and <laughs> yeah so it was and it was like you know I learned about ones and twos and or ones and zeros I guess and uh you know did my best and we also had our our humanities classes together and and um I mean it and ironically most of my friends from my college days either were in the engineering school or the architecture school <laughs> So whatever they did, it, it, it helped us to find ways to communicate because it's, you know, we do speak different languages. I mean, it sounds like we're both speaking English, <laughs> but we mean very different things sometimes. So it was, it's been a great idea and a great, great project to work on. And yeah, I would like to see more, more collaborations like this between scientists and artists. I mean, why not? It's like, you know, I, I, my own life has been so enriched by, I mean, I've been looking at palm trees for 50 years and, you know, now I know more. I know actual things beyond what they look like and what they feel like and what they smell like. I know how they retain water in their trunks. Yeah, I mean, so for me, right, FNPS had to say, Oh, sure, Valerie, why don't you drive to Withlacoochee Gulf Preserve rather than doing some other work thing, right? And then, you know, this has to be a priority for, you know, Marjorie, it was a priority for Marjorie to get this issue together the way it is. You know, I'm connected with Dr. Putz, uh, Putz, and then I have, you know, I had that old footage you saw I put into the video, and then, of course, I need a deadline. Um, actually, I needed two deadlines, uh, one to get the draft and then the other to, to was today. <laughs> Finally finished the edit today. Um, so just having some external forces and a lot of dedication from everybody, Marjorie, Jack, you, Ellie, uh, and of course my boss, Juliet, and the rest of the board who thinks that this is important for important communication work for us to be doing. I mean, that's what makes it happen. And of course, this is something that I'm interested in. Just, you know, everybody's personal drive, too. Well, yeah, the, the video turned out real well. So your efforts paid off. Thank you. I'm trying to get better at editing. And my camera, my, my camera work could use some improvement. <laughs> and I thought it was it was really nice to be able to see 
the whole painting from hmm. blank canvas to finished product. It's, you know, it's the invisible part of the art biz. And it's nice to have the invisible made visible. Hmm. Ooh, Danny Young is pointing out that um, Florida has a prohibited plant list that can prohibit plants before their arrival. So I must be mistaken. I will definitely do more research before I write that blog article. Well, that is all the questions in the chat and we are ooh, 12 minutes over time. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for you your time. Me. And you yeah, know, yes. <laughs> just so much time. And I just, I really appreciate the flexibility and the, you know, getting back to me and everybody talking and you guys are great to work with. So. I hope I see you this weekend. Yeah. 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 See you Friday. Okay. Great. All right. Bye, folks. Bye, everyone. Bye.